Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Jumpin' G. Josephat. E. Audrey Daniels. Andy, I, I feel like I owe it to myself and to you to check in about my absolute obsession with Ian Fleming now. I I love that you're obsessed with Ian Fleming. I think I'm that's just so cool. Absolutely obsessed. And I think from the from the last time we spoke, uh, I had only finished uh, Casino Royale and I was about three quarters of the way through Live and Let Die. Live and Let Die, I finished that. It was uh, it was great. And then I finished Moonraker and that was the one that I was most nervous to to read. 
uh, because my memory of the movie just doesn't hold up. I watched the trailer of the movie again, and I remember kind of what was going on in the film, and it just is, doesn't really hold up. And now that I have finished Moonraker, I can tell you with great confidence that I am angry at the adaptation process of James Bond. The book is wildly, wildly better than the film. And I mean, it's not just, I can't even understate that a little bit. It's not just, oh, you know, it was kind of a sloppy day. It's a different movie. It is a stupid movie. And I am, if I were alive at that point, I would have written a strongly worded letter to the producers. Does it have Jaws uh, meeting that girl, bad girl? bad guy girl and jaws they, is a is a fiction jaws is a cinema fiction he's part of the bond cinematic universe as as i've just made up uh he's not in this movie he's not in moonraker wow yeah yeah you know what else happens spoiler they don't go to space really yeah yeah well, they don't go to they, space it's a grounded film it's about a it's about a uh it's it's a nuclear weapons thing and it's great Interesting. I mean, they went to space because of Star Wars. That's, you know, they they wanted to find a way to kind of tap into the cultural zeitgeist. So, well, they they screwed it up, I guess. It's so royally. Ah, it's so royally. And I'm worried. I'm now in the middle of uh, Diamonds Are Forever. I'm not in the middle of it. I finished like the first chapter. But let me just tell you, that one does open with the Scorpions. So... Mm. small win I'm, i may be getting back on track i don't know but so far i am i'm, I'm gonna keep uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to keep checking in because i am i can tell you after now three and a little bit books i'm hooked i'm in it wow yeah i'm gonna ride this one out well good i look forward to uh, hearing how they all turn out what else you got going on you do anything good i saw two movies this week um no other than the film board movie i haven't really had a chance to do much of anything well that was the one we did the Hail Caesar, and you were a real curmudgeon about that. <laughs> and then the second one I finally caught up on was uh, was uh, The Big Short. Oh, yeah. What'd you think? I adored it, and I was so mad. I was so... <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, it was that's so it, good. That's what it does so well. <laughs> I was furious. I mean, fuming. I couldn't get up. I couldn't, like, physically stand up at the end. I, like, watched the credits and was gripping the armrests. I was like, I hate these guys so much. Uh, yeah, but I, you know, I loved everything about it. That whole avant-garde bit of, um, you know, of using these kind of fourth wall tools to explain an incredibly complex topic and make it dramatically interesting to me was was really powerful. I thought that was terrific. Yeah, it works really well, and it's done in a way where it also is kind of pointing out the fact that our attention spans are too short to actually figure these things out unless a celebrity is <laughs> like here's margot robbie in a is. bubble bath <laughs> <laughs> and also you know it tells us you know this is something important and now you can probably forget about it <laughs> oh man because i don't know what margot robbie was selling <laughs> that was yeah it was it, it was a pretty powerful film we also watched specter again uh over the weekend and i think i'm telling you that has improved with age Nice. Maybe it's because I'm on my bond bender, uh, but it's it is much better even than I remembered it. It's not the worst of the Daniel Craig's, certainly. Well, I I definitely look forward to catching up with that one again sometime soon. Yeah, because I I mean I you know I enjoyed it. I know um, it's gotten accused of being boring and just not kind of messing messing too much with some of the history and stuff. But you know. I I remember having a good time, so I'm curious to see that one again. Did you uh, did you see anything this uh, this week? Did you do anything good besides? Uh, I think you already told me you said no. Uh, no, I you know it's it's Girl Scout cookie season, and so I've been uh, when we have free time, I'm out door to door helping my daughter sell Girl Scout cookies. This is my favorite time of year. Can I tell you what I did? It's so bad. I actually, uh, I, I I made sure that our neighborhood Girl Scout came to my door when my wife wasn't here <laughs> so i could order oh man so i could just burn the barn down with cookies i mean i i went i went a little bit crazy and then i told her i said you got to make sure you deliver it just to me just to me and i did that move with the eyes like the two fingers in my eyes two fingers in her eyes you know that move oh yeah I said, do we understand each other to this girl scout 
And I don't think she did because she ran away screaming to her mother. <laughs> I kid. That's a joke. Yeah. Terrible. Oh, those terrible. thin mints. Thin mints. There's frozen, a new cookie this frozen year. Frozen thin mints. Mm. Are you are you are you happy with the new cookie? Have you? You know, I don't know what the new cookie is for you because they they change in different markets. They do. What's the yeah. new cookie for you? The Savannah Smiles. Okay, tell me about that one. What, what am cookies. I missing? Oh, They're, we that's our we got that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are those are my new favorite, and uh, yeah, because I've never had them before. They're delish. Do you get like as a as a family? Do you get uh, samples? No. What we do get is boxes and boxes of cookies sitting in our house <laughs> all the time, saying, "Hey, eat me! I'm a delicious cookie." <laughs> <laughs> I could see you at like, you know, 400 pounds and you are yelling to your daughter, put another one down for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's Andy. getting close to that point. Oh, That's why I got to keep walking it off. I go right. door to door. <laughs> That's right. Oh, good on you, man. Well, should we tell the people where we're from? Yes, where are we from? <laughs> This is the next reel on Rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that over there is Andy Nelson. Howdy, howdy, howdy. And we spoil movies tonight on the show, the second in our series on great films and their remakes, with our first remake of the bunch, the outer space homage to High Noon, Peter Hyams' 1981 Outland. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever felt the urge to right great wrongs, thwart villains, and decompress some dudes real, real good while you're at it, well, then you should head over to The Next Reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag GuessTheMovieChallenge. And with that, let's head on over to Scotland and check in with Stephen Smart, who's busy mining titanium in the Scottish Highlands. Hey, guys. Last week's movie was 70s Noir Night Moves from 1975, directed by Arthur Penn and starring Gene Hackman, James Wood and Melanie Griffith. Congrats to At Fegfe who guessed it on Image 3. You're entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts Monday, so thanks guys and see you later. We've got some follow-up from the Blot Spot. Yes, he says, I like the semi-real-time aspect of High Noon, and I think they did their best to build tension. The real problem is they didn't have enough plot to fill the hour leading up to the confrontation, so the film dragged tremendously. The climax was okay, but didn't have the punch that I was expecting to close out the story. Gary Cooper gave a very bland performance, and I have to agree that I just see Lloyd Bridges as his silly airplane persona now. Don't even get me started on that song. Now that was so tedious. The idea of this film worked for me, but the execution did not. Your rank 103, my rank 182. That was a really good reading, Andy. I think when you started saying tedious, you turned into a mean girl. (laughs) Is that what happened? That was so tedious. (laughs) (laughs) I think we agree with uh, with old Ben Lott on this one. I think we do. I and, I, and, I think we do. Yeah. And yet somehow we ended up uh, 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 pretty far away from him in the ranking. Yeah, I I attribute that to my um, clinging to the need to still rank it as a classic, and maybe I I couldn't quite pull myself away from that. Well, thank you for accepting the blame. That makes feel me feel better. <laughs> it's it's all on me, Andy. Let's do trailers. <laughs> So I found out about my uh, the trailer for or the fe- the movie for the trailer that I'm going to talk about, which is called Creature Designers: The Frankenstein Complex. I found out about this uh, via a tweet by Joe Dante. Joe who, Dante, yeah, who uh, is uh, interviewed in this film. He is a a a director who has had a lot of creatures in his films, and he is interviewed in this documentary along with other directors and uh, creature designers. This looks like a really fun documentary, just kind of about the whole world of of creature effects and kind of that real world uh, creature design. And then it also looks like it kind of looks at the CG side of things. So you got you've got makeup effects, you've got robotic effects, you've got stop motion animation, CG, all of this sort of stuff. 
used to tell the story and how these people come up with these things to do that. This looks like a really interesting documentary, the sort of thing that I just would just totally eat up. It's uh, premiering right now at the Berlinale uh, Film Festival and Market, which I believe is starting. If it hasn't started already, it's starting very soon and goes for about a week or two. And it's going to be playing there, and then hopefully it's going to be out in the rest of the world. But, um, you know, this is the sort of thing that, as a young film fan, special effects were really kind of one of the first things I latched onto. And just watching monster movies and just special effects and Indiana Jones, and you can see, like, the 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 crazy clouds coming out of the sky and going down into the arc and just all that sort of stuff. I was so mesmerized by how they did all these effects. And the creatures just always blew me away. And having a whole movie kind of talking about these people behind the designs of all this stuff, it just thrills me. I love watching these guys talk about the passion they have for this and where it came from. I, you think? I could not agree more. I I really enjoyed this trailer. And frankly, I don't think I had ever actually seen some of these guys that right, I feel like right. I've been talking about for a long time. Some of them look like they may not live regularly in civilization. <laughs> <laughs> that was really great. Uh, I just I, there. This is a, a film that celebrates just straight up imagination, and I, uh, you know what? It, I'm going to amend that. It's straight up imagination and where it meets science, and I think that's really fun. I mean, inventing the mechanics, and inventing the programming, and inventing the 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 applications that actually drive their imagination i think is it's like it's it's a dream for a humanities major you know i mean it <laughs> ends up being i think something really to celebrate and i can't wait to see it you know i will say the one person who i was really hoping that would pop up in here is rob botine who we talked about on the thing and just the amazing stuff he did on there and he also yeah. worked on seven and fight club he's worked on just some amazing projects and then he kind of disappeared from the scene in 2002 after working on mr deeds of all things and uh, it's just like you know, i i mean i think he had done one episode of game of thrones recently but it's like i have no idea what the guy's up to anymore and i would love to have kind of caught up with him or gotten a better sense of what he's doing now and and hear some words from him but regardless even though Rob Bottin is not in it there are a lot of fantastic people in here so i am excited totally agree when's it hit um i don't know yet cuz it's still at the film market in berlinale and it's going to be one of those things, you know, see who uh, picks it up and where it gets out to. But if nothing else, you can go check out the trailer right now and then just uh, cross your fingers that you'll find a way to watch it sometime soon. Follow them on Facebook. All right, then. We should do that. My trailer is uh, tonally uh, a little bit different than a little, yours. A little bit. Uh, m- my trailer is uh, Mike and Dave need wedding dates. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, this is this is this is going to fall into the realm of of uh, a sentence as a movie title, like Zach and Mary make a porno. Yes, there's a there should be a series, I think, um, for another podcast. So this is uh, comes from director uh, Jake Zemanski, uh, writers Andrew J. Cohen and Brendan O'Brien, uh, stars Anna Kendrick, uh, Zach Efron, Aubrey Plaza, and Adam Devine, and uh, Stephen Root. You got to throw him in there. There, there. You oh, yeah. know, there's a bunch. There, there are a bunch of people in this, but th- those are the big ones. And uh, it's the story of these two brothers who are apparently idiots, and they they are such idiots that their parents say they can't come to this to their sister's wedding unless they get dates that will tone them down. Right. That the, the, apparently they want the dates to be uh, ladies and they will come and, and tone them down. And the ladies, uh, Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza, uh, they don't tone them down. They end up being the, the they end up being the bros in, the, in this brotastic um, movie. And they <laughs> end up being just horrible influences, even on these guys who are already idiots. So I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, I laughed at this um at this trailer. I really did. Uh, I really like Adam Devine. I think he's really funny on, uh, um, on Modern Family. And uh, it, so I, I, I was already predisposed to kind of like it. Of course, Anna Kendrick, Aubrey Plaza, uh, you know, she, hey, she did a Hal Hartley movie. I'm, I, I dig uh, Hal Hartley so much. It was, it was guilt by association or fandom by association. So I laughed at it. But the reason I really wanted to talk about it was because it seems like this is one of those movies that is that is uh you know it 
it's a an infantile sort of film that that is actually shooting for gender equality in a way that I think <laughs> is really funny. That it's making these women uh, the foil for really offensive things, and I think these and these guys are also behind uh, you know neighbors and neighbors two sorority rising. If you haven't seen the trailer for sorority rising, it's exactly the same thing. I mean, this is Selena Gomez leading a gang of you know thuggish offensive ladies in bikinis, and it's it there. There's a lot to you know if you're sitting in a theater with your mother as I was. There's a lot to find offensive about it, but I, I'm not going to lie to you. I laughed at that too. Hey, that trailer made me laugh more than Hail Caesar did. <laughs> what do you think? Am I am I on on track here? I I agree with you. I this is one of those. I was like, oh, this is going to be just sh- absolute <laughs> garbage, and I was just laughing. I th- I thought it looked really funny, and it may end up being a bad movie, but I guarantee that I will end up laughing at it. I, I'm I'm in favor of uh, of gender equality if it allows me to see dumb movies like this, um, and and so I say dumb with the greatest appreciation. Uh, yeah, I I can always look at Anna Kendrick and kind of go if she's in it, I'm like okay, I'm gonna give that a little bit more of a benefit of the doubt because I feel like she picks projects not just. Uh, for like a check. I think that she kind of is looking for something a little more. And maybe that's just me reading that into her, but I feel like that's kind of what she's doing. So so I give it I give it an extra vote for that. Right. And and I, you know, I look at Zach Efron. I I don't think I've seen a single film that he has done since high school musical. And I've seen about 20 minutes of that because of my kids. So I haven't seen anything but but um Dirty Grandpa intrigues me. It's got De Niro in it, and he looks good in the trailer. So I'm, you know, I'll probably see it. Yeah, it, it looks like something that I'd watch late at night. I agree. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, here's hoping he can pull that off. And uh, and you know, the dude's cut. And talk about aspirational. I need to go work out. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's. Do you remember what it was like to be young? Yep. <laughs> There was you a should, day. You should always just say no because that lets you off the hook. <laughs> I don't remember. Did that, just, did that make it sound should more I, pathetic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It made it more pathetic. Uh, anyway, so my uh, my film hits. See, you um, you want to say yep because if you say no, it sounds like you're so far away from having been young <laughs> that you can't even remember it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it was yesterday. I got to go work out. <laughs> well, this uh, my trailer hits July 8th. 2016. Excellent. It's a summer romp. Ah, Andy, your wife is one stupid lady. You want to go get drunk? In a mining town on the second moon of Jupiter, something deadly is happening. soon you'll see that this is just like every other mining town. I work these people hard, and I, uh, I let them play hard. There's never much trouble. We're all professionals. I'm sure we are. Outland, the ultimate enemy is still man. Outland! Oh, Andy, this may sound familiar. A marshal, personally compelled to face a deadly enemy, finds that his town refuses to help him again. Outland 1981 from direct writer-director Peter Hyams uh, stars Sean Connery, Francis Sternhagen, Peter Boyle, uh, James Sicking, Kika Markham, and Clark Peters, among other fantastic people. I had seen this movie before, I yield the floor before I give you any sense of my take on this because I want to hear what you thought, Andy. Go. Well, and knowing that I had never seen this before. Yeah, yeah. I I ended up liking this, uh, and I really wasn't expecting to. Yeah, you I, did. <laughs> no, I I expected to totally think this was just just terrible eighties, uh, you know, just awful sci fi and. It had some issues, but on the whole, I actually really ended up enjoying this. And I think I actually enjoyed this more than High Noon. Yes, you did. Which oh. I wasn't, I also wasn't expecting, especially before rewatching High Noon. 
So <laughs> I am I am pumping my <laughs> fists in the air, Andy. That is such a win. Oh. Uh, yeah, and I was really surprised. I, I, one of the things that most surprised me was actually how little of a remake or just kind of a retelling of High Noon this is. It really only kicks in in the, like the last. Yeah, the last twenty five minutes or something. Yeah, it's like the last act is yeah. kind of the High Noon portion of this. Thank which, God. <laughs> well, which which actually I think benefits the story yeah. because you don't have that uh, entire film with like, I mean, High Noon's big problem in the second act was the plotting of the marshal going around trying to find people to help him. We didn't have to worry about that. We have the kind of the one obligatory scene where he's trying to find somebody to help him and it's not, it doesn't work. But up until then, it's like there's the, kind of this detective stuff going on, trying to figure this out. You've got some great sci-fi stuff with some really fun effects. I had a blast. I am so relieved. <laughs> I I am really relieved. I deeply enjoyed uh, watching this movie again. It took me all the way back. It it felt in some ways. I mean, there were some sequences that felt dated. There are some sequences that have I have a little bit of trouble with that don't that don't hold up quite as well as they did. But generally, I think this film offers a a much more interesting, uh, uh, much more interesting story than it is than its reputation would allow you to believe. And uh, I think Sean Connery is is actually well placed in this film. I don't find him uh, strangely miscast. I I think he is an an interesting marshal. I love his team. It has a, a very much an alien vibe to it. Like if you if you got rid of the the bad guys in the last act and you replace it with alien creatures and turn some lights off, the the whole uh, home aloneing of the of the uh, space station uh, could really have been done in in an aliens type film. And I I thought that was really interesting. It's a, it's a taut kind of little uh, gory uh, chase sequence. And I, I thought it was just great. I really enjoyed it. Um, If there's anything that I had trouble with, it's, it is uh, that the reward in the third act at the end, the big fight at the very end. um, I think the lesson is uh, fight scenes between two dudes in spacesuits are just not that interesting. Uh, (laughs) you know what I mean? They just move a little bit too slowly. And, uh, and so it's a little bit, um, tough for me to, to, to really find that a a compelling fight at the end. But there were some sequences in here that are really taut. Steven Burkhoff, uh, it it plays a bit role in this film and he is, uh, center, uh, to a terrific, uh, standoff sequence that I think it just celebrates a, a really interesting, muted view of the slums of space. That's something that uh, I really appreciated. I mean, Hyams, uh, Peter Hyams, who directed this, um, he has said how influential Ridley Scott uh, and what Ridley Scott did with Alien and Blade Runner, um, how they were for him, and uh, just trying to develop this story. I mean, he wanted to make a Western at the time, and nobody would let him make a Western, because Westerns at the time were considered kind of dead, a dead genre. No one wanted to do them. No one would buy tickets to them. And then he realized, ah, the Western has moved to space, but now all of the frontier stories are in space. And so he's like, well, I'll just write a Western, except I'm going to have it in space. And that's exactly what he did. So he came up with this story of this mining colony, which is kind of like an old West town, and kind of created the story about this marshal. And I and and then of course pulling some of those high noon elements. And I think it works really well. And and he said that he he said, I thought of the Dodge cities of the past and the oil rigs of the present, which I think uh, is uh kind of paints it nicely, the way that the look has that very industrial feel, which is again something he pulled from Ridley Scott. Everything is is really about uh, function, not form, and it just has this. Uh, it creates this look for the moon of Io on this uh, this little mining colony that they have there that really seems authentic. I really felt the presence of the world here. I did too. You know, I one of the um, the. Uh, critics quoted on the Wikipedia page is Desmond Ryan from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and he calls it a brilliant sci-fi Western. In many ways, Hyams has made a film that is more frightening than Alien because he surmises that space will change us very little, and the real monsters we are liable to encounter will be in the next spacesuit. 
I, I could not put that better. I think that uh, that's one of the things that he does so well is he sets it in an environment that I I'm all, already have an affinity toward, uh, but he he eliminates the, the movie monster element and makes it the human monster, and suddenly it's a movie that I think is much more terrifying because that could be anybody uh, that's out there trying to, you know, wandering around my the, the hallways with a shotgun. I mean, it could be anybody. And so I, I think it, uh, it ends up being really compelling. Yeah, the um, I mean, it's it is a nice touch. You know, you've got these evil corporations in both the Alien franchise and in this film, and uh, it certainly seems uh, very prevalent today. So it's it's definitely something that that you know even back then filmmakers were latching on to how these corporations can kind of take over and pretty much uh, run things and rule uh, rule people and the government is kind of gone because I mean this is really about corporate interests and how these corporate interests are really kind of overlooking this this drug addiction that people have to basically get work done um, more get more work done and um, they're kind of okay with people who freak out and kill themselves or kill others because hey as long as more work is getting done and our production's higher and we can sell more then that's that's great and so it's it's great seeing that story placed in this and i think that addition to the story of this high noon story it it just gives so much more meat to that element of the story than it did in high noon where it's just you know frank just wants to get revenge yeah, yeah, I no, absolutely. I think it gives it a, a much more interesting element. Peter Hyams uh, is, you know, I'm I'm looking at his uh, directorial credits. You know, he'd come off of Capricorn One and Hanover Street, which uh, with Harrison Ford, and I had not seen that, um, which I probably should. It looks like it's one that's that might be worth seeing, uh, and then into Outland. Um, but he's also done some films that I really enjoy. You know, from uh, he did 2010. I actually really liked that. I think I'm I may be in a minority. I remember liking it, but um, Tom Hanks, who is a huge 2001 fan, um, I believe at one point he said, uh, you know, Peter Hyams should be taken out and his legs should be broken for what he did with 2010. <laughs> that seems like such a not a Tom Hanks comment. I know. I, I think he must have been drinking before he said that on uh, Letterman, I believe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed Narrow Margin, uh, Gene Hackman and Ann Archer, and again, James Seeking. Uh, I, he's, uh, he did I, end, end of Days, right, with Schwarzenegger. And I, I love Stay Tuned when that came out, and, and Time Cop was a ton of fun. Yeah, Time so, I mean, Cop was also a he, ton of fun. He's, he's kind of, uh, he hasn't had much um, in the last decade or so. I think Sound of Thunder was such a big um, problematic film and such a big flop that um, I know he's, I think he's kind of struggled getting stuff out. I think the other stuff that he's ended up putting out may have all gone straight to video. I don't think Beyond Reasonable Doubt got a theatrical release. Well, it's too bad uh, because, you know, I think he's, you know, maybe he's he's moving on. I don't know. But but I think he has kind of this, uh, you know, the the high noon vibe sort of in his bones a little bit. And I think structurally the, the changes that he made to the, to the tone of high noon and to the structure of high noon really uh, work very well. And he added the story that we felt was missing uh, in, in the original uh, and, and made it more of a story about that uh, than just waiting. And I think that ends up being structurally in terms of the script. I thought it was very natural. I think it, you know, there was not, uh, none of the dialogue felt very strange. And I think this gets back to, I can't remember who said it. I, I'm almost sure you brought this quote up uh, that the, um, you know, the, the trick to doing, was it Asimov? Or the trick to doing good sci-fi or believable sci-fi is taking a, a believable, or like a normal everyday setting and solution and changing one thing. Right. Well, that's kind of what this feels like, right? It doesn't take long for you to feel like you're, you're in the space station, that the space station could be anywhere, it's not until the third act that we really realize the the impact of their location. They could be underwater, a la the abyss. They could be, I mean, the setting in those halls, they could be anywhere, a military base, whatever. Um, it's the it, it ends up being the story, I think, that drives it forward, the search for these drugs and the, the fantastic battle between, uh, battle of wills between Peter Boyle and Sean Connery. Yeah, they uh, they work really well, and it's a it's cast well. I think that he brought some great people onto this. Um, I think Peter Boyle has a strong uh, 
presence for somebody who's kind of running a mine, you know, on a mine, on a on a moon. Like he just he seemed to fit that role really well. Even though you don't really see him doing much in the way of leading, but just just his presence just I, I don't know. I seemed to feel it, whether it was like the way that he was talking to uh, Connery in the meeting or just all the scenes in his office, like the golf stuff, which I, there's something about that that just seemed so right for that particular character. Absolutely right. I, I thought he nailed it. And he's every time I watch it, I'm, I'm surprised anew that this is Peter Boyle, because I, I think about him as, you know, Frankenstein's monster. I think about him <laughs> as kind of the comedian. And um I think he just he really he really nails the mob boss uh role. Yeah. Um so uh, let's talk about first of all before we get more into the cast let's talk about how this thing got made the the uh, production of it. You already said that it was a western that was never going to get made. How did how did it end up getting on screen? This is a, a movie when when um so like I had said Hyams had written this script uh, kind of his Western in space, and he, and he was getting it out there, and he found some producers. I believe it was uh, Richard Roth, uh, Richard A. Roth, that he was talking to, and um, they uh, everybody was a, a kind of having a difficult time with the title because the working title was Io, which is the name of the moon out on uh, from Jupiter on which this uh, this mining colony uh, resides. And uh, they said, look, you got to change the title. Nobody, it, it, it looks like the number 10 is on the front of the script. No one knows what it is. And, and Hyams was like, no, 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 no. Everybody's going to know that this is Io. And so he's like, come on, oh, we'll do a poll. And so they just walked out onto the street and they just asked, like, I don't know how many random people, like 10 random people or whatever. What does this say? And everybody said 10. <laughs> <laughs> and so so Hyams is like, uh, okay, I guess you got a point. So they brainstormed, and I believe, I think it was Roth who came up with the actual title, Outland, which I, I like. I think it's a nice title. It uh, it has a vibe that puts it in kind of a place and kind of a, a mental space. So I think the title works really well. And then, uh, so these guys then uh, went to the Lad Company to get uh, get the film made. And the Lad Company... It was a company that Alan Ladd Jr. started, I believe. Um, you know, he was a son of Alan Ladd, and uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a big guy in the in the film industry. And um, he was actually somebody who I think, when he was working at Fox, actually wanted to get Star Wars made. And uh, so he's kind of big in kind of that sort of thing. And I. I can't remember exactly what happened with him, but somehow um, he ended up leaving Fox because um, I think he went from president there and then Star Wars, Alien, all that stuff was there. He left to form the Lad Company, and I, I'm not quite sure what the story is. I can't I can't recall why he didn't stay with Fox with the Lad Company, but they actually ended up going over to uh, Warner Brothers and kind of working with Warner Brothers. They kind of had this deal there. And starting in 1980, they started cranking out movies with Warner Brothers. And under Warner Brothers, the Lad Company became uh, kind of kind of big and it certainly is a logo that i really recognize mostly because of blade runner that logo of that tree that kind of grows in scan lines as you watch it um really kind of uh i always remember that but i mean um aside from outland they did body heat they did chariots of fire um night shift um the right stuff and so uh, then, of course, they start getting into stuff like Police Academy, but, and they also did Once Upon a Time in America. So they did a lot of great stuff. And then um, because of some problems that they ended up having in some films that just didn't make their money, they ended up having to close their deal with Warner Brothers. And I believe they actually are still around doing stuff, kind of doing co-productions, like they uh, co-produced to get Braveheart out, and most recently Gone Baby Gone, actually. So they're still around, um, but... Uh, there's nothing like the stretch they had with Warner Brothers in the early 80s. So I don't know. I, I mean, I kind of went on about the Lad Company, but I think that they were a, just a great company back then. And I love seeing companies like that that uh, really kind of push the limits. And Al, Alan Ladd Jr. actually came to set. I believe it was the day that they were, you know, the guy who goes uh, kind of 
like um, very peacefully walks into the the elevator. Yeah, without yeah. without a spacesuit on, and he goes all the way down, and then he come. Then when they get it back up and they open it, his his body had decompressed, and and he'd basically exploded. Um, Alan Ladd Jr. looked at it and said, no, 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 you need more gore. You really need to kind of amp it up a little bit and really wanted them to make sure that it, it looked like a guy had exploded. And so, I don't know, Peter Hyam says that uh, working with the Ladd company was one of just the the most dreamy ways that you can put a movie together because these were people who really respected film and really wanted to make good stuff and let the creative team really be creative. So I, I think that's just an amazing, uh, amazing thing to hear. Well, I think it's really cool, and I think you know, given that you've already introduced the, uh, um, you know, the exploding, the exploding elevator boy, uh, <laughs> I think we should we should transition into the visual effects because uh, the visual effects are. I I don't think people talk enough about how cool the effects are in this film. They look ridiculously dated, I think, in some cases, but in some cases they really hold up. I you know. I think they're really fun, and it really surprised me because I, I mean, it happens so quickly when you start the movie, but when you get kind of an exploding head, I was like, "Wow, I wasn't expecting that." That kind of uh, perked me up a little bit. This was the era of exploding heads, I think. <laughs> right? I mean, we had just come out of of Dawn of the Dead and uh, Scanners, also 1981, which is really an exploding head film. And uh, and and here we are in Outland, which not only gives us the exploding head, but the decompression. Now, when people normally think of this effect, they think of Total Recall and uh, poor uh, Quaid. Uh, oh yes, you know, getting getting his eyes sucked out. And and I will say, in Total Recall, they definitely moved the effect forward because the eyes oh, yes. they were then on stalks, you know, and that was <laughs> they did the full snail, and uh, so that was pretty gruesome. <laughs> But you see that effect in this film, and they had this this wonderful, um, essentially a balloon mask uh, that had the different components that would inflate and move in different uh, at different times as they inflated this head, and then the uh, the propellant explodes the the blood and gore out uh, into the mask into the elevator. It's it's really uh, it, it was really yeah, I. I I remember the first time I saw this, I thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. It it was just really kind of fun to see. And like I was saying um, about uh, visual effects earlier, it's just, it's thrilling to watch that sort of stuff happen on screen. And yes, it does look dated now, but it just, there's this visceral presence of it that just makes it, uh, makes it really kind of feel like it's just a part of the film and part of the story. And I, I really just dug it. So I couldn't find a, a film that did decompression uh, exploding heads in space before this one. But I think if you think Total Recall was wholly original, you need to see Outland because they do it more. And the heads actually full on explode. Oh, yeah. Totally Pretty worth it. Pretty quickly, too. It's, yeah. It's yeah. You know, you don't a, have a lot of time. Not, not a slow process. You move it forward, people. <laughs> yeah, I don't We're think any schedule. heads exploded in Sunshine. They uh, they really no. didn't go for the exploding heads there. They, But in Sunshine, wait, they, they lit on fire. No, but there's the one guy who tries to leap across and, and uh, he misses and he ends up just, you see him just basically freeze. He yeah, doesn't he decompress. Freezes. He just right. freezes. Right. It turns out, as uh, as you may know, I went into a little bit of a rat hole on this whole thing, and I'm going to post a link uh, to a, a fantastically disgusting um, uh, Gizmodo article where they, they actually wrote up what really happens when you are pumped, pumped out of an airlock in space. But I, I will just say uh, that um, I'm going to read this passage. At this point, you're not dead, dead. You're just mostly dead. Your brain is still functional and your heart is still going. You can still be revived, surprisingly, with minimal permanent injury if you're immediately returned to an atmosphere. However, this savior window lasts 90 seconds. After that, your blood pressure drops low enough that it does begin to boil, which damages your heart and nixes any chance of resuscitation. It is so... This whole article is so bad. It goes through the the every sort of second uh, as your body begins to adjust to space. Wow! Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sleeping with this on the mind. I don't think I'm gonna be able to shake it. Another <laughs> reason that I probably just won't ever go to space. Yeah, 
But definitely go to Gizmodo in the show notes and check this out because it's really awful. Um, the other thing that was, that was I think, um, uh, really highlighted, showcased in Outland is uh, IntroVision. What is IntroVision? Yeah, I, I had, uh, I mean, obviously I've seen IntroVision before without realizing it. And uh, it's, it's just, there's this different uh, ways of doing sort of model work. And IntroVision, just reading from Wikipedia, was a variation on a front projection process that allowed filmmakers to view a finished composite of live action and plate photography through the camera's viewfinder on set and in real time. During its heyday, starting with this movie, IntroVision enjoyed the novelty of visual effect compositing in camera, thus eliminating the, the need to wait for photochemical compositing. So basically, filmmakers could build models and have all of this stuff on set, and they could also do front projection, and they could have all this stuff playing together, and they could watch it, and they could actually film it all happening. And this is really kind of where it uh, where it got its roots. But I mean, geez, it was used all the way into The Fugitive when in the big train crash sequence. So it's a uh, it's um, uh, I think that CG may have kind of killed the need for it, but I think up through that point, this was a very effective tool. It is a, a very re- reliable, I think, uh, you know, precursor to the virtual camera, right? I mean, this is this uh, we talk about the the sort of the uh, how how fantastic it is to be able to have these three D sets and virtual cameras that directors can you know adjust in real time. But what this lets you do is that that real time compositing is fantastic. And so when you read about how this thing was produced, they started all the model work you know two months before uh, they started the actors, so the the models were were ready to shoot. Uh, by the time the actors got on set, it seems like a really efficient way to to, to do this at the time. Uh, so we'll put a little video in the show notes. There's a fun little video. It's very short. It's about three minutes on the effects uh, of Outland, and and uh, it's it's worth checking out. Very cool. Very very cool. So cinematography uh, achieving that uh, uh, that gritty uh, space western look was Stephen Goldblatt. I think they capture a really great look here. Hyams typically likes to shoot his own stuff, um, but I think this may have been early enough in his career where he was still having other people do it. I'm not quite sure why he had Stephen Goldblatt do it, but I think that Goldblatt um, does a great job here. Um, A lot of shadows, a lot of dark. I know Hyams really likes to kind of keep things dark and... um, He's one of those people who, you know, if, if a character is using a flashlight and the whole room and the audience can see the whole room, he's like, well, why is that person have a flashlight then if we can see everything? If somebody's using a flashlight, he says, you got to have a dark room that you can't see anything except for what the flashlight is shining on. I think that's really smart. And I think that working with Goldblatt to achieve that, um, he does that. And also, I think he... Um, between the two of them, they have a very good sense of space. And in a widescreen frame like this film, I think they do a great job with the wide shots and a great job with the, the close-ups, just finding the right way to compose all of the shots. I'm just going to say this, Stephen Goldblatt. Uh, I, I think he, had, he is a, an incredibly versatile DP, right? He went from Outland, which was early in his career, I think it was like his sixth or seventh film, uh, to... Um, uh, Things like Young Sherlock Holmes, Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2, our favorite Joe versus the Volcano, uh, which, you know, gives you a chance to do those kind of comic uh, sets to the Prince of Tides, uh, which showcases just gorgeous, um, uh, like beach scenes, um, you know, at the lake or at the water, you know, it's East Coast down by the Carolinas or something. Anyway, I like to pretend I'd never saw it, but it was beautifully shot. <laughs> Uh, to the legal thrillers, right? Pelican Brief, and and then of course, uh, you know, Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. So you know, yeah, he's all over the place. He's and all he's still over the place. Yeah, still working. Uh, the Intern, his most recent, but of uh, the Oscar winner, The Help. He uh, he was DP on The Help in 2011. So he's he's all over the place, um, and I think it's it's really fun to see just how capable a, a DP was. You know, in his very very early days, he's just terrific. Absolutely. Uh, we've talked about how much we love the the look of the thing. Uh, production designed by Philip Harrison. Any comments on the? Any additional comments on the design? No, I just I think that it was really solid. I love the models, and like I said earlier, the uh, decision 
I guess really between Hyams and then also Harrison to kind of create this this kind of rough oil rig sort of environment for this mine. I really just enjoy it from the way that the, the all the doors are almost like it makes you feel like you're on a submarine because you've got those giant hatches that they have to kind of it's I, I'm expecting little spinning wheels that they have to pull to kind of get in and out of each of the doors. I, it just it works so well. And the way that they blend the model work to the real stuff. I mean, I, there's a shot really early on in the film where you see from just really far away, you see this mine and then you see this door open up and you see these figures getting out, like getting ready for work. And then you kind of follow them and you kind of track back across the model and then and you see kind of the whole expanse of this, this uh, frame that they have to do the mining on. And then you keep pulling back and then all of a sudden you have actors right there and you have this scene of these guys doing the mining. The way that they design all that and just the sense of space. And I will say as far as one of the set pieces that actually I think was one of my favorites that uh, I give uh, kudos to Harrison for putting together is kind of the chase through the living quarters. The big chase scene that we have um, midway through the film where uh, where Connery is after the uh, the drug dealer. And you're going uh, you're going through these uh, these narrow little passageways, upstairs, downstairs, like all over the place. And then it ends in a kitchen where you've got this, this last fight. And, uh, I, you know, I thought that was just so well constructed as a um, as a set. I really enjoyed the sense of space there, and both to Harrison's and uh, really everybody's credit, I really had a sense of where I was. I never felt lost. Absolutely agree, and I think that's one of the best foot chases. But to this day, it was just a great use of space and and uh, every dimension. Uh, and being able to shoot it is just. Just great. Which leads us, I think, to to editing. I mean, I think this is really tautly edited, and it's fantastic that we only just talked about uh, Stuart Baird uh, very recently. Yeah, he did uh, Casino Royale. So it was great looking at this as something, another film with some uh, some good action sequences that he had done long before he got to Casino Royale in 2006. I think that uh, Baird just has a really solid sense of how to tell a story efficiently. This film had some slow pace stuff. And I got to admit, when this film started, and it, it, it was kind of just a lot of slow text, a lot of expository a lot of text. Yeah, expository descriptive text kind of explaining things to me. I was like, oh, Lord, this is another Star Trek The Motion Picture, which <laughs> I think is one of the most difficult films to watch because the pacing is so, so slow. And I was really nervous at first. And then the movie starts. And I've got to say, despite it having some some nice slow bits, those are those are actually paced appropriately in the film, and the film actually moves by at a clip that I really uh, thought was a very fresh modern clip. I I really agree, and I I think you know you can see it when you parallel the the chase we were just talking about um, through the the living quarters into the kitchen with the parkour chase in Casino Royale. I mean, you look at those things side by side and look at how the the action itself is constructed. And even though Outland gives you this incredibly claustrophobic um, kind of interior and Casino Royale's parkour chase is so expansive and big, the way the shots are are constructed, the, the pacing of the run is is very similar. I think they you can really see the sort of uh, cinematic DNA um, of of Outland, even in in something like uh, that Bond. So it's good. funny. I, I hadn't actually uh, thought of comparing those two sequences, but that's actually a really a really good comparison. The parkour sequence and this sequence, the way that there's ups and downs and just in and out and through things. I mean, that actually is a really apt uh, way. It almost makes me think that maybe Martin Campbell and his team looked at this yeah. sequence a little bit, and you know, it's uh, it's interesting. It really that's that, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Let's talk about Mega Sound. Mega Sound. <laughs> that is just a name that was destined to die. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. <laughs> yeah, this was a sound system that uh, Warner Brothers actually created back in the early 80s and it was it provided extra deep bass enhancement to uh to uh, movies when they were released. I don't know how many mo- how many theaters ended up getting equipped with mega sound, <laughs> but um, I, I wonder if it's the same number as uh, feel around. 
<laughs> feel around sound. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, let's see, theaters equipped for mega sound had an additional battery of speakers consisting of subs and horns. Usually all were placed on the stage behind the screen. This system also came along with extra power amps and specialized processing equipment. Mega sound selected soundtrack events with lots of low frequency content. Thuds, crashes, explosions, etc. were directed to these speakers at very high volume, creating a visceral effect intended to thrill the audience. Mega sound has been best remembered for its infrasonic rumble capability. So. I want to get me some of that. Yeah, I guess uh, it, interestingly, it was allegedly tested on select audiences using the 1979 re-release of The Exorcist. Oh, that would have been creepy. That would have been really interesting to see. But uh, at least according to Wikipedia, it was only ever used on four films. Altered States in 1980. Oh, I love that movie. It, that movie is a trip, and it, it would be interesting to see it in Mega Sound. And then three movies in 1981 Outland, Superman 2, and Wolfen. And that was it. Wow. That's yeah, so I funny. Mean, I mean, you, you look at it and, and you think about Mega Sound, and then you compare it to something like Atmos, another right. Dolby thing. And uh, I, you, you know, I wonder. I wonder how, if, it's, if it's one of those things that's going to catch, really catch. Well, yeah, right, exactly. Like uh, how, I mean, there certainly have been more Atmos films than this, and I think more theaters have subscribed to it. But um, yeah, it does make you wonder, like with all the different constant changes that they have, you know, what is the next thing to uh, succeed and what's the next thing to kind of just fade away? Yeah, so fascinating. I will say the sound mix on the movie when I was watching it was pretty impressive. It's pretty good. Yes, it is. Yes, uh, it is. For what it's worth, it was shot in Pinewood, um, uh, you know, just like every big British space film. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Peter Hyams, um, somebody, um, he commented that somebody on IMDb said that uh, he's a DP director who loves natural lighting. And I guess he actually responded to the person on IMDb and said, you know, if, if you're talking about natural lighting and you mean by by having control of the lights, yeah, then yes. But uh, I like to shoot on stages. He, he only likes stage work because he has complete control of the look of what he's trying to achieve on the film. And uh, so, you know, creating natural light may be but certainly not filming in natural light. Um, it, but it's interesting because that, you know, I well, I, I don't think I could uh, uh, make much of a comment about nat- stage lighting versus natural lighting because obviously this film is so artificial in terms of light, but the use of light and the way they create light and dark contrast I think was really good. One of the things I, I you know, a couple of the highlight sequences, the uh, when you talk about the the chase through the, through the uh, the third act right the, the when he's outside and you've got the the you know the miscreants running through the halls I, I thought that was really interesting because mostly it's really bright right they're in those giant tunnels and it's all white and everything's white then they go into the greenhouse and you get these high contrast red and black and green and black uh you know panels um uh, the plates that I think are are really great contrast to what we had just seen and i think it makes for a a great visually interesting uh chase uh, as a result well and then going from that to the exterior where you've got the final fight yeah right the final fight on the grid yeah Uh, no i I, it's got a great look all the way through so absolutely all right well let's talk about our favorites uh in the cast we've already talked a bit about sean connery this is, you know, as much as I enjoy him in Untouchables, I vastly enjoyed him more here. There's something about him kind of as the lead where he's carrying the story that just, I guess I just really end up connecting with more. And sure, he won an Oscar for that one, but there's just, he really fit this world. And I loved him as that kind of high noon marshal who's, uh, you know, kind of stuck by himself having to figure all this stuff out. And I love those moments where he's, you know, using his little spy cameras and he sees, he sees, uh, you know, um, James Sicking's character uh, having a meeting with Peter Boyle and kind of realizing how alone he is because his own team of people are all kind of working for the man. I, I, I love that kind of sense. And you've got that, you know, his, his wife forsakes him. And you've got that scene early on and just like there's some great moments there. And man, 
that monologue that he has when he's sitting in the, uh, I guess, the futuristic racquetball court with Francis Sternhagen, what a great moment he had right there. Yeah, one of, my, one of the best. And visually interesting, too. Again, super bright. And, and I love that incredibly wide shot in that racquetball court where it's just, I mean, there's it's perfect. No distortion, no nothing with them as far apart as they could be having such a great intimate conversation. Absolutely. Uh, I thought he was great. He was he was just what I was looking for. He had been acting since nineteen god fifty seven. Uh, so by the time he was in this movie, I mean he did this, and then right after Time Bandits, King Ag- Agamemnon and the Fireman. And uh, I remember thinking, who's that old guy? You know what? He acts, <laughs> he's still going. He's he's <laughs> it's amazing that guy. Yes, he is. Yes. Uh, anyhow, so Sean Connery, terrific, uh, Marshall, and he's a great. Uh... Just going to him, the character, and uh, also to the script for a moment, I I think that it's really strong that you don't have to have a big, like, knockdown, drag-out brawl with Peter Boyle at the end of this film. Mm-hmm. I thought that showed some great restraint from Hyams that, you know, he dealt with the the uh, the problem people that Boyle had brought, but then the confrontation with Boyle was him just knocking him out, and then, and then he leaves, and did you, you know— Okay, did you like that? I loved it. Okay, I thought I thought that was great because then it's because as as a as an audience member, I knew okay, we had that conversation earlier where Boyle was talking to the guys to bring them here, and and the guys when he tells them that they're here to kill kill the marshal, they're like, oh boy, you know, if if this fails, the next time that people are coming down, it's going to be for you. So you pretty much know that oh well, now it's his turn, you know. So I I really enjoyed that. So I I. This is the first time I started thinking about this, but what would it have been like had had uh, the marshal just arrested him, right? The the punch, it, while it was momentarily gratifying, it seemed a bit out of character for me. And I I think having him, um, you know, come up and just there was he was not defending himself. He was not uh, it, this this whole sort of revenge punch seemed like strikingly eighties. Um, and, and may, of course it was made in the eighties, seventies, eighties. So that's, that's appropriate, but it just seems like it was, it was a little bit too much machismo for the character that we have gotten to know. I can see that. I can, I can definitely see that. I guess in my head, it kind of fit a little bit with the, uh, the high noon aspect of it, where he kind of takes care of the miscreants. And even though he doesn't arrest Peter Boyle's character, he has has kind of you know I mean he's been kind of eavesdropping in all these conversations so he knew that that person had said that to Peter Boyle's character that yeah. if if these guys failed in killing uh, Sean Connery's character that uh, they would uh, come and get him so I for me I think that it was uh, it was a great way to kind of resolve it because we also knew that that was him throwing his tin star in the dirt you know. I mean, as soon as we're he's done with that, we see him writing a letter to his wife saying, "I'll be there. Save that ticket for me." Yeah, yeah, and packing his bag. I, I guess uh, the the reason it it falls a little bit deaf on me that final sequence is just because we had such we've had two sequences by now of of Connery and Boyle together uh, trading barbs, and so we know to date their experience together is based on words. And how and and who's going to be sh- the the sort of sharpest wit, sharpest tongue, and so re- resolving their relationship with a punch is is a bit too um, brotastic for me. I'm going to give you points on that one. I think that's a pretty pretty good point there. I feel like I that's maybe my second point in the show tonight. <laughs> You've well, got like good. you all consistently have. I mean, you've got probably fifteen, but I'm just saying, as long as we're keeping score, I appreciate it. I'm going to take my points. There you go. All there right, you go. Francis Sternhagen. Wow, <laughs> she's so good. She's Man. so good. She's this is this is she's just brassy. She is smart and mean and self-deprecating, and she is the ultimate foil and partner for Sean Connery. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just loved her to pieces. I mean, she's somebody that we've talked about before on the show. She was in the hospital. Yep. Yep. And I feel like there was another one, Misery. She was in Misery, of course. Yeah, that's right. Look at her. So, 
Yeah, she's she's great. And I man, I just have fun watching her on screen. She plays that kind of uh that just cynical sort of person so well. And the relationship that she has and just the attitude she has about being the doctor. I mean, she's just such a grumpy doctor. You know, she <laughs> you, you meet her and she's berating this nurse for getting the thousand slash a hundred wrong on the on the page. And it, it's just great. And then and then to see him do the exact same thing to her. I just loved that. It starts so antagonistic. And then the way that they kind of grow and this relationship kind of forms as the two of them come together. And then really, she becomes the only person that really supports him. And I really liked that. Yeah, I like that they didn't go with, a you know, with the, the young leading lady, you know. I mean, they went with somebody who really had has dramatically more presence than, than Hollywood typically does. And, uh, and I think she was, she was a terrific addition. The only problem that I had with it is that I I did feel that in some way it did dilute a little bit of that man, uh, the high noon, you know, man left all by himself to his own devices to tr- try to figure out how to stop these guys. I mean, I... I really enjoyed her and I enjoyed that she does end up helping him. But so, so I mean, I enjoyed it in the context of the story, but when I look at it in the aspect of, hey, this is a High Noon remake, that to me is like, well, they kind of messed that up because I don't feel that quite as much. He's not alone. Well, I, I guess I sort of disagree because in High Noon, he's not really alone. He has Grace Kelly, and I feel like they needed somebody to scratch the metaphorical face if they're going to do that kind of a thing. I mean, he had uh, Cooper had an assistant in, in Grace Kelly in High Noon, and well, that he to did, me is the he... role that, that Francis plays. I guess the difference for me is that he didn't know that that he had Grace Kelly. He thought he was going into it all alone, and essentially he did until the gun start, the gunfire started, and then she kind of came to his aid. This one, I mean, he he knew that she was she was helping him, so he he never really felt alone. That's 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 my sense of it. All right, I'll give you one point for that. <laughs> all right, James Seeking. He's uh, Doogie's dad. Ah, oh, Andy, he's Doogie's <laughs> dad. Oh, I've been dying to place that. <laughs> Glad I could oh, help. Oh, he's totally Doogie's dad. That is where I know him from. <laughs> oh, so yeah. good. He was on Hill Street Blues. I mean, he yep. has been around for just forever doing lots of stuff. And actually, he is quite the Peter Hyams regular. I think that he's been in, uh, gosh, Capricorn 1, this, The Star Chamber, and Narrow Margin. I think the two of them have worked together on all those films. Goodness, he was in General Hospital in 1963. Note to self, General Hospital's been on since before 1960. These soap operas are bananas. Uh, 73, I believe, right? Or was he? did he start in 73? Well, the, so the show started in 63. Right. He was on 73 to 76. All right. All right. There you that's, go. Uh, that's I'm just, that's I'm why just I was confused by your... I was of, like, well, I see 73 here, but then I realized that was his, yeah, his that term. Yeah, that was his... Uh, you're right. I didn't even look at that. I was just really focused on the fact that, holy cow, 1963, General Hospital. Oh, yeah. That is crazy. I still haven't been able to beat the Luke and Laura storyline. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kika Markham uh, plays the wife. Uh, we don't see her very often, uh, very much. Uh, but you know, she she abandoned Sean Connery. What are you going to do? You'll have uh, no friends at this table, Kika. That was that was that was rough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the big uh, surprise foil at the end is Clark Peters. Uh, he he takes over as the sergeant when uh, uh, James Seeking is is uh, uh, is done for. And uh, and he uh, is the he's the guy who puts on the suit and he chases him and they have the punch off on the grid the slow motion punch off in spacesuits. Uh. <laughs> you know, I I loved the moment where he's like grinding uh, Connery's head up against the panel and like the sparks are shooting everywhere. Yeah, I just wish that there was a little more to that, like something about kind of the sparks and everything. I was like, gosh, that seems so cool. Um, I wish that it was like shorting his suit out, or I yeah. wish that they had that actually 
integrated that into the fight a little more than they did. Yeah, it was a visual that was cool, but there was no sense of threat because it was a helmet. Right. Like it, right, it exactly. was not causing him pain. Right. So I didn't get that. I, I felt like they didn't sell that very well. And that was just uh, sort of my problem with the final fight. I think it was that that's the, the weak part of the film uh, of an otherwise fantastic film. But uh, he's I really like the way he plays it. And it's a little maybe a little too obvious when he's he's grilling Francis Stern Hagen says, well, where is he? Where? Right. No, oh, really. Is, where is he outside? Yeah. <laughs> right. That that was. If there's any problems I have, it's it's some of the foreshadowing in the script. Or yeah. Just it's it's pretty blatant. It's, it's like. <laughs> it's pretty blatant. That's true. Yeah. Uh, the sequence that I am I am most thrilled with though of of all of them. You know, you take get get rid of the foreshadowing, get rid of the fight in the greenhouse. It's the Stephen Burkhoff uh, scene. He has gone bananas from the the drugs, and he's taken a prostitute hostage, and he is. So wired uh, in this, he's just riveting. You're just you're just thrilled that your boy from Under the Cherry Moon is back in action. Why do you? Of course I am, but <laughs> you say it with just such disdain. <laughs> no, he's great here. I actually really <laughs> like Stephen Burkoff. This, you know, he plays such uh, such mean characters. I mean, he does it so well. And he does it really well here. I mean, he's really kind of scary here. He's so scary. Not a guy I want to run into on a street corner at dark. No. <laughs> uh, I John Ratzenberger also uh, in in the film as Tarlo. Uh, obviously, John Ratzenberger we we know from Cheers uh, as Cliff Clavin. He was also in uh, the the um, Toy Story films. Every Pixar movie. Well, he's actually yes, he's every Pixar movie. Uh, and he gets his head blown up here. You're certainly yeah. not going to see that in a Pixar movie. No, no, you don't. I want to see that so badly in a Pixar movie. Do you? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> oh, man. I want, I, actually, I would like Pixar to helm a remake of Outland. <laughs> uh, that's good. Uh, oh, anyway, so wow. that's the that's anybody else in the cast that, that you enjoyed seeing particularly? You know, the only other one that I was going to bring up was uh, uh, the voice that we hear when uh, when um, uh, Peter Boyle's character, uh, Shepard, when he calls to bring in the troops to take O'Neill out. Do you know who does the voice for that that he's talking to? Um, I'm no, I don't. It is uh, Charles Chaffee, who we talked about way back on our Clute episode. He is the guy who played Peter Cable, the bad guy. No kidding. It is true. No, I didn't know that. I would not have picked that up. It's not a voice that I, I recognize easily. No, I, I didn't either, but <laughs> trivia, man. Trivia. Nice. nice. Uh, this is another J, your favorite J for the music. Good old Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, we've talked about him uh, a few times recently. I I love what Jerry Goldsmith does here. This really kind of feels um, almost like a sister score to what he did in Alien. Absolutely. He, he creates that just very dissonant uh, sense that really kind of fits so perfectly for this type of sci-fi film. It is. This is one of those that that I mean, it's it's great sort of atonal sound layer. Um, it is one of those scores that is inseparable from the film. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I had heard much of the score. I may have heard like the theme, um, but that may have been it. And then, uh, and then I watched it and I mean, it's, it's completely identifiable as a Jerry Goldsmith score. I, yes. I could just hear instantly that it was him, but, um, just the way that he, he paces the chase scenes, um, and the investigative scenes and everything. I mean, it just, it works really well in context of the film. Uh, and yet, they apparently didn't have a credits editor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, they didn't. Not just the credits, but just like the uh, all of the uh, on-screen text. I mean, I was really blown away by the uh, the typos that kept popping up in yeah. here. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good. I uh, I didn't notice all of them. Uh, I I did pick up uh, principal. Uh, you said dependent. It was misspelled a few yeah. times. Anything else that jumped out at you? There were others, yeah. but um, I but yeah, I wasn't write writing them down. them down, and so uh, yeah, I missed them. But um, it's just 
I don't know. I feel like that's one of those embarrassing things that it's like when you go to a restaurant and they had the 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 guy who paints in the in the windows like their whatever their special is that they're doing and they <laughs> misspell a word. It's like how did somebody not catch that in the process of of bringing that to fruition? There, I always think, okay, somebody inevitably is going to know how to spell the word right. So let's have them just make sure. <laughs> somebody, uh, <know>. please. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's the worst when you see it like on a chalk menu, because you know it's written in chalk. Yes. And what that means is nobody can spell or nobody is reading it because nobody has fixed it. Chalk menus I, are the worst. When I see chalk menus, especially the ones that are in reach, the thing you, that I like you about fix those them? is I always try to like, <laughs> if those you chalks do. are, I'm that guy who's always trying to fix the chalk menus. You're an activist menu editor. <laughs> That's what you do. Here, here. You know who probably doesn't need an editor? Who's that? Alan Dean Foster. <laughs> what do you think about that? He writes in beast mode. He needs he no is, editor. He is a writing fool. That man cranks him out. We just talked about him uh, briefly. With the, yeah, what was it? It was, was it the Star, Star Wars The Force yeah, Awakens that's adaptation. Right. Uh, and he also wrote the adaptation for this, Outland. You can go read it. My goodness. Does that guy corner the market? He has done so many novelizations. Uh, I mean, just looking at the standalone novelizations, I mean, starting back in 74 with Dark Star, which is, yeah. uh, you know, John Carpenter's student film, ostensibly. Uh, Black Hole, Clash of the Titans, Outland, The Thing, Kroll, The Last Starfighter, Shadowkeep, Starman, Pale Rider. That's an interesting novelization <laughs> for him. Chronicles of Riddick. I mean, yeah, he is, uh, I mean, and then, of course, he's done, like, the Transformers uh, movies, Terminator, Aliens. I mean, it's t- tons of Star Trek. It's crazy. This man it. is so busy. So busy. I love that he has he, he has a thing. He's got a market. Yes, he does. We should have markets. <laughs> We're working on it. Andy, how did it do? This film did okay. It, it didn't, um, you know, it didn't break box office records or anything. But, uh, you know, it did all right for itself. It cost $16 million is what I found in uh, 1981 dollars, which is about uh, almost $41 million today. Um, it ended up making domestically about $20 million, so about 51.2 in today's dollars. So, you know, it made just enough to get by. Um, adjusted, that's about $93,000 per finished minute in today's dollars. Not bad. And I, I think that it is enough to say this movie is underappreciated and you probably haven't seen it so you should go see it that's my that's my pitch here here and as somebody who's never seen it before i've got to say i'm so glad to have watched it and discovered this little uh, bit of sci-fi joy oh 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 i'm my heart is warm <laughs> let's flick chart it shall we let's do it head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you can see our list of movies and uh, uh, it, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pick this one. We're going to rank it against all the other movies that we have done. And I think it's going to break the top 100. That's my pitch. I think it is. That means it has to pass the first one, Pete. Uh-huh. <laughs> what is the first one? Outland or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, crap. I know. This is why it gets hard. I got to say Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <sighs> I'm sorry. I feel bad because I really did enjoy Outland. I feel like you just, that's the first shovel full of dirt that you were putting <laughs> on the on its grave. Wow. You can challenge me. No, I can't in good conscience challenge you, Andy. I too will pick Oh Brother. All right. Outland or The Sandlot? Outland. Now here, I will go with Outland. <laughs> yes. Outland or The Roaring Twenties? Outland. Definitely Outland. Outland or A League of Their Own? Outland. You know, here I'll do A League of Their Own. Hmm. There's literally no crying in space. (laughs) There was no crying. Your head just explodes. Your head just explodes. It's like your body cries, one for, big blob of blood. <laughs> for fun, I will challenge you on this, Andy. I think Outland should be uh, ranked higher than A League of Their Own. Here we go. All right, ready? One, one two, two, three, paper. paper. 
All right. One, One two, two, three. three. Scissors. Rock. Oh, sorry, man. All right. You know, you do what you got to do. I do what I got to do. Outlander, Syriana. Uh, Outlander. I'm going to do Syriana. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Uh-huh. One, One two, two, three. three. Scissors. Paper. Oh, crying <laughs> out loud. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Outland or the deer hunter? Oh, I just am, I just, just, the deer hunter's tough to watch. It is tough to watch. It is really, it is a, a, so a feat good. of strength to watch that one. It is so really strong. Hard to watch. I'm going to go with Outland. I am too. Even though Deer Hunter is the better film, I think. Outlander, The Verdict. Oh, Outland. I really liked The Verdict, but I'm going to pick Outland. And uh, Outland, Pete, or Field of Dreams? Outland. Outland, Outland, Outland. Outland. (laughs) Okay. One, One, two, two, three. three. Outland. (laughs) (laughs) Outland crushes rock. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll give it to you. Actually, I'm just I'm feeling like I'm feeling very generous. I'm going to give you Outland. Is it? Are you one. feeling generous because you've beat me at every turn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That puts it at 135. So it didn't quite crack the top 100. But you know, we've talked about a lot of movies on this podcast, and uh, you know, it's still it's almost in the top 50. percent Man. I wish I could grade people that way in my classes. You're almost in the top 50%. Still great. Wink. <laughs> oh, well. All right. What are you going to do? How's this do for your star rating? So curious. This is, uh, you know, it's a tricky one because I actually like this more than High Noon, which I rated four stars last week. I feel like this is a three and a half right now for me, which is weird because I actually like it more than High Noon now. You, so, uh, that should, I'm going to give it a four I, and a half stars. I think I, I, I feel obligated to bump it to four because of that. So I'm giving it a four. So you're at four and a half. Yes. All right. There you go. So do we do quarter stars? Is that how it works? Well, it's 4.25, which will round up to four and a half. I love rounding up. I feel it's, like I lost a lot, but I, I still ended up a winner, Andy. Thanks. You did. It's good. Letterbox. Letterbox.com slash the next reel. Check out our profile over there and our lists and how, how just just a lot of joy. There's a lot of letterboxed joy over there. And now, uh, Andy, where do we go from here? We're moving into a new uh, original for our originals and their remakes series. We are. This is going to be. Um, I'm looking forward to this one. Neither of us have seen Infernal Affairs, and uh, so we're going to watch that. And followed up with its remake, Martin Scorsese's The Departed. Fantastic. I, I haven't seen Infernal Affairs, but I really am looking forward to seeing The Departed again. Uh, yeah, me too. And I'm really curious to see kind of the comparison between these two. And yeah. uh, it's interesting that Infernal Affairs, I think, spurred two sequels, I believe. And uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever heard of any plans for kind of following suit with The Departed, but that would be an interesting way to go. Totally. Absolutely. Well, this is going to be a, another good pairing. And uh, until then, I'm going to go to bed. All right. I'm going to go put on my handy dandy neck protector and go poke around in a meat locker looking for drugs hidden in the frozen beef. I'm, you know, we're relegated to the two stars, Andy. Did you yes, see this? Are. Nobody yeah. likes the transfer. The DVD is terrible. Blu-ray's much better. I got mine on iTunes. It's beautiful. But apparently, everybody who got the DVD left one star on Amazon. Nobody left a one star that was legitimately about the film uh, on Amazon. So I begin with a two star by a customer entitled Slow Slow. Slow. I wanted to like this movie so much. I love Sean Connery. I love outer space epics. I love Lone Man Against Hired Guns movies. 
I hated this movie. I couldn't believe how phenomenally slow this movie was. The dialogue was just very mundane. I can't remember a single scene that stands out as good. It almost felt like you were watching a small group of really dumb people trying to think of something to say about a topic they neither knew nor cared about every time two people ended up speaking to one another. The big finale with the mercenaries showing up to kill the sheriff was just a non-event. Can't people think of a cool way to kill bad guys in the future? Nothing in this movie clicked for me, and I really tried to let it work. If I was given this DVD, I'd never unwrap it. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, Can't another think one of the novel way to kill people. people in the future. I mean, come on, blowing them out of the out of the hatch. I thought that was great. Heads exploded <laughs> multiple times in this movie. I think they didn't see this movie. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Well, I ended up with a three star by Michael Clavelli, who says pretty good cop story in a sci fi setting. It's unusual seeing Sean Connery in a film this old where he isn't a dashing undercover agent, but he's pretty good in it. On the whole, it's not a bad movie. It ju- it's just that it doesn't sci-fi well. You can take all the elements of the story and set it in an urban setting, and it's pretty much it pretty much worked the same way. Yeah, it takes place in space, but it's not that like people are being used as pods to farm alien life forms, or the machines are becoming so sentient that they're hypnotizing workers to kill themselves. Nothing like that. But it's not a bad movie. I think that Michael kind of missed the whole point and yeah. the whole idea of having a story like this uh, in space. I mean, it can be anywhere, but the fact that it's in space, I think, is what gives it uh, those intriguing elements that make it uh, work so well. Hypnosis robots are so played. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what, I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. 